Hey, thanks for tuning into the Banff Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Lafferty, and with us today we have a genuine RPG legend, Mr. Jeff D. How you doing, sir? Hi, everybody. I'm doing great. Yourselves? Uh, we're good, good. It's it's always you've been here a couple times. I think last time you were on, you were promoting uh, Cave Master. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Um, thank you so much for making time in your schedule to come talk to us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me back. And in true Banff podcast style, we have a uh, gallery of co-hosts, um, starting from left to right with Mr. Walt Rebilliard. How you doing, Walt? A gallery. That is gallery. fantastic. Well, I've gone through gallery, roundtable, cornucopia. I'm just I'm working my way through the thesaurus here. <laughs> right on. Um, uh, directly to my right is Alice. How you doing, Alice? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. And Laura Hank Corner. Last but not least, Mr. Brandon Powers. How you doing, sir? I am feeling powerful and on the weekend, so it's wonderful. Oh, perfect. And for anyone not in the know, um, Alice and Brandon run the Baby with Knives podcast. Um, they do a lot of actual plays and demos over there. Please check them out. They're going to be famous one day. You can say you heard about them here first. And Fanny go and Banff has a, a Patreon, so go give us money. Um, anyway, with all the promotion out of the way, uh, Jeff, uh, for any of our listeners who maybe aren't clued in, could you just give them a, a brief rundown of your involvement? Um, you, you were a TSR artist way back in the day, and these days you are probably best well known for... Uh, well, I want to call it Villains and Villains and Vigilantes 3, but we should really call it Mighty Protectors. Mighty Protectors. You, can, you can call it both of those things. Okay, I thought that there was... It's 3rd Edition V&V, and it's, uh, it's got its own title, uh, which is Mighty Protectors. Okay. I thought there was still some legality um, hanging out there. but the, if, oh, the, no. the only issue is Jack Kerman and I don't own that trademark. We have, uh, we have the right to use it, but we don't have the right to let anybody else use it. Okay. Otherwise, it's fine. Okay, so people who do licensed products for you are doing a licensed product for Mighty Protectors. That's correct. Okay, cool. And we have uh, one more addition to our squad of uh, uh, co-hosts. Uh, there's Jacob Blackman. How you doing, sir? I'm very happy to meet Jeff D. Hi, Jacob. This is I, the way I, I felt too today, I, I, Jacob. This, this is how I felt too. I run across your posts a lot uh, on Facebook, Jacob. Nice to nice to chat with you. Big fan. Yeah, Jeff's been an, an inspirational yeah. figure to lots of us in RPGs. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Jeff was one of the most well-known artists from uh, uh, early days of D&D, back in the TSR days. Uh, Deities and Demigods books is one people often associate you with you. Uh, associate with you. Um, uh, what, what, what are some of your, uh, I guess, what are some of your highlights from that part of your career? From the TSR days? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very well known for my work in Deities and Demigods, uh, including the Mel and Ann section that got stripped out for legal reasons. Um, and uh, I, I've, I've just got stuff sprinkled all through various adventures, um, too numerous to mention. All right, all right, all right. Um, well, hey, uh, these days uh, you are head of Monkey House Games with your friend Jack uh -huh. Herman. Yes. And... Um, as we mentioned previously, you released the new edition of Villagen, uh, Villains and Vigilantes, forgive me, which we call Mighty Protectors. How's that been doing? It's doing great. And I should also mention, I've got two companies. The other one is Unigames with my partner, Manda, who also goes by Taljamir. So uh, Monkey House Games does our Villains and Vigilantes things. We got the, all the publishing rights back to our original V&V books, and, uh, and we've got the new third edition out. And Unigames has done a bunch of things, um, including our new Tecamel role-playing game called Bithorm, uh, based on a setting from the very second role-playing game ever published. And uh, Cave Master, which you've mentioned, is from uh, is from Unigames. Okay, cool. Um, I think I might have just found the Unigames uh, website. Let me share my screen yeah. and see if I got this right. Uh, one sec. Modern technology. We go share screen application window. Firefox. Is that you, folks, right there? That's Unigames. Okay, cool. And if you if you follow the links on that, you can go to the Bethorm. Uh, website. It's got uh, bethorn.com has got its own uh, got its own get dedicated site. Okay, it's cool. Part of uh, our, our biggest product. Okay, and what systems is that for? Or is that its own system? It's its own system. Uh, it's the uh, the pocket universe system from 
computer games that we've used in a couple of things. Uh, it's a 2d10 based system uh, where you're rolling two 10-sided dice, adding them together and trying to hit a target number or less. And uh, there's, it's not a skill, uh, it's not a class-based system, so experience points buy you more points of uh, skill at specific tasks. And uh, uh, I don't know how deeply you wanted to go into that. No, no, it's, it's cool. i uh, like to have you on. Um, we've been, I, I was really intrigued by uh, one of your recent posts on Facebook where you were talking uh -huh. about um, immersive RPGs as a separate genre. And I was kind of hoping maybe you would uh, give us some of your philosophy on that. Right. So uh, I've got a bit of a reputation in the industry as a guy who lashes out uh, cruelly against what's called what they call story based RPGs and narrative RPGs. I'm not a big fan of um, shifting the focus from uh, being in your character over toward writing stories about your character, which to me is a fundamentally different thing. But I'm, I'm tired of being that mean naysayer guy, so I thought a more constructive thing to do might be to come up with a term for the thing that I do like and then just talk about that. And because uh, of course people can decide what they prefer and I, I don't want to get anybody's way of of types of games that they enjoy so um uh so i was thinking what are the things about rpgs that i think are fundamental and vital to the kinds of rpgs that i uh personally prefer and what i think it was the core of what was exciting and new and cool about what Dave Arneson and his group came up with, uh, you know, just in the days before D&D was published. And I thought the two main things are immersion, that you are, that you are living from within a particular character and seeing the world through their eyes and affecting the world through their abilities. And the other one is that it's a simulation. It's um, uh, there's a world around you that you have to deal with to get things done. So, um, so I looked online for the the term um, immersive simulation games and found out that it was already in use in the computer games industry for games like uh, Thief is a one of the one of the most well-known examples. It, instead of, like in a lot of cu uh, computer games, and I've worked on the Ultima series, right? In a lot of computer games, you need to, everything is about solving puzzles or simply getting powerful enough that you can bash your way through some opponent and get, your, get to the next goal. Um, in a simulationist game or immersive simulationist computer game, it's more about setting up a world that has laws and ways that things work and then you're set loose to solve your problems and achieve your goals in whatever way that you can within the the within the rules of the world right it's not just pay this guy x number of dollars or 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 get this item and give it to that guy for him to give you the key so you can get in the place. It's more like, well, if you've got the explosives, you can blow a wall in the side of the crypt instead of worrying about getting a key. Or if you can acquire the magic item that will let you pass through a wall, you can do that. Or if you can climb to the top of the crypt and find the place where there's a loose shingle, that you can smash and break in that way, right? You've got all, all kinds of different options. So uh, that's, and what was interesting to me is in reading that Wikipedia article about immersive simulation computer games is that uh, computer game designers referenced in that article talked about how their inspiration is tabletop role-playing games where you can do all those kinds of things. And, um, and yet I didn't see a lot of or any uh, tabletop RPG designers speak in speaking in the same terms or using the same the same phrase for what it is they're after. So I've kind of latched on to that as the thing that I'm 
trying to think about more that, and start promoting. Yeah, that's actually a term that Brandon and I have talked about um, over the past like 20 years on and oh, off great. because uh, because to me, <clears throat> I completely agree with you, Jeff. There are systems like Fate and Powered by the Apocalypse that tend to be very non-immersive because they try and use that narrative of the non-system system to try and generate your effect, whereas there are a lot of systems like certain D&D systems that are very immersive, certain D&D systems that aren't. And so it, it's something that I absolutely agree with you. I've had games where if I'm role-playing, I literally get yelled at by uh, by my fellow players because I am role playing rather than giving them system. Uh, and there are other situations and other systems that that doesn't happen. So I am completely understand what you mean by that. It's a it's yeah. definitely a term that I I trigger on. And, and nothing against you know mm -hmm. uh, story and narrative type games. Those are fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm done quibbling over whether what happens in those games is properly called role-playing. They want to call it that fine. Um, uh, and and also, you know, I, I want to push a little bit on the, uh, on the issue of system. I think that a well-designed immersive simulation system can support that kind of play rather than getting in the way and i and a lot of uh i think a lot of the impulse toward getting away from system uh and moving toward narrative uh is uh, has been driven by mechanics that are not as well designed as they could be to promote uh, immersion and uh, and simulation. So just just for example, I've had a really interesting uh, exchange with a guy on uh, on on Facebook on this on this point of uh, uh, this issue of hero points, right? A mechanic where the player has access to a resource that is not an in-game resource, right? So it's the, the force points in a Star Wars game are not quite the same thing. Those are actually a simulationist mechanic of the Star Wars universe. But games that simply give the player power to, uh, to, to modify the situation in ways that don't have anything to do with their character's abilities. Um, and I said, well, you know, to me, when I see that in a set of mechanics, I what I my reaction as a designer is, well, you the designer has embraced a crutch to fix the fact that their mechanics are not producing results that players will be happy with. And uh, I think one place where uh, this is a problem is on in D20 based systems where there is no dice curve and you have as much a chance of rolling a one as you have of rolling a 19 right um the the problem is that no matter how good you are you can roll the bad thing and there's a pretty decent chance of that happening all the time and then players feel like well i'm not getting um I'm not getting full benefit of my character's abilities. I got ripped off by the dice rolls. Whereas in games with a dice curve where middle results are more likely, you uh, the result of that is that abilities tend to perform more as expected. And, uh, and the guy I was talking to said, wow, you know, you're right. I do feel uh, a need for a story points kind of mechanic when I'm playing a D20 game, but I've never felt a need for it when I'm playing Champions, which has a 3D6 curve, right? So your likelihood of getting an unusual result in a system where there's a curve is much less than, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's a much greater chance of getting what you expect uh, if there's a curve than if it's a flat roll. So there's things like that that I think can be brought to um, a explicitly uh, immersive simulation RPGs that can make those function more toward, uh, toward delivering that kind of experience. 
so while we're right. on the topic of hero points, and uh, I, yeah. I definitely do agree because I've I, I like hero points in mutants and masterminds, and we've tried them when we play champions, and they just don't work out that well. Like I, I, they've never really fit in the system. I've tried them a few different ways, including the heroic action points that they write in. But one aspect that I love in uh, Mutants and Masterminds is that you can uh, stunt your powers uh, by by using them uh, to, you know, allow characters that are have a superpower that you don't see every time. You know, Flash originally when he's going through walls, uh, that's not right. something that he put on his character sheet. What are your feelings on that ap application of them? Well, well, I'll tell you what we did in Mighty Protectors, which awesome. is a D20-based system uh, entirely because uh, it's uh, it's the latest incarnation of a system that I originally you know co-designed back in uh, '79. So long before I'd had the thoughts that we're talking about now, long before I was aware of these issues, and long before there was even, was even such a thing as Hero Point, right? Um, in uh, in Mighty Protectors, uh, in so revised V and V, which came out in '82, had this thing called inventing points, and inventing points were a resource that players had, the player characters had access to, by virtue of their intelligence and their experience level, and you could use them to come up with new things on the fly, and uh, it, it wasn't exactly. A story points kind of mechanic. It, it, in, in fact, it wasn't. It wasn't a meta mechanic at all because the number of points you got depended on what your character's abilities and stats were. Um, but in switching over to third edition V and V, where we've done away with experience levels and gone to more of a point construction system, and your experience points are more of the same points, we couldn't just. Uh, start throwing additional points at you out of nowhere, uh, they, they had to fit into the system. So what we have now is in addition to the points on your sheet that are invested in particular things, you have some more points that come from your intelligence uh, that, are, that are like floating character points. And you can make skill rolls in the game that with modifiers based on do you have the kinds of resources you need to achieve this invented maneuver or gadget or spell or uh, or, or whatever it is, right? Uh, and how much time do you have? And then you make a roll and you either succeed or you don't. And once those points are spent, you have an ability, just like any of your other abilities, paid for with those points. But if you ever decide you don't need it anymore, you can just let it go and get the points back. Likewise, if you fail to succeed at coming up with a new thing, uh, eventually those points come back. So we've just taken that same kind of thing and worked it into the simulationist mechanics of the game, uh, allowing you to do that kind of thing, but kind of thing, but without you ever stepping outside your character and saying, you know what it would be neat if Cosmic Boy could do right now is blah -de blah right? As a writer rather than as a character thinking, well, what can I do? What do I know how to do? And what are my resources? Right. So. Awesome. Hey, so. Uh, would you mind if we pivoted and asked you a little about your creative process? I mean, you're one of the best known artists in um, in our, the RPG industry. <laughs> and uh, we've been trying to um, kind of change things up in the podcast a little bit and, you know, talk to creative people about, you know, how they create, if they have, you know, a specific kind of workflow or if they're more organic about it. Would you be up for talking about that a little bit? Do, do you want me to approach that from the art end or the design end? Um, does I was, it matter? I was thinking art specifically, but whatever you're most okay. comfortable with. No, let's, let's, let's talk art for a while. Um, okay. so, uh, um, this so is a horrible let's, say I've, let's say I've, I've, I've picked up a, a contract job from someone. I do a lot of, uh, contract art. That, that, that's, that's mostly how I pay my bills. Uh, and the, and the client wants a, picture of a thing or a scene or something um i ask for as they always always want to know how much description do i need uh to go on and I, my answer is always 
as much as you want because if you only care that it's a woman shooting a blaster and you don't care where she is and you don't care what she's wearing and you don't care what color hair she's got and and all that kind of stuff then fine i'll make happy to make those things up uh, but if it's a very specific character that there's that's described elsewhere that and you need it to fit uh the other other text in your in your book then by all means tell me that stuff um so then i uh uh, I can't tell you, like most artists can't tell you, like how I come up with my idea for how to approach this. I mean, apart from the details of what, what has to be depicted, right? It's like, uh, I was just hired to do a street scene outside the uh, White Knight Inn from D&D module, was it A3? It's Slaver Stockade. Um, and so I, I looked at the I looked at the module and there's a map and I said, okay, he wants it to be outside this drawer. What would be a good camera angle? I came up with an idea and I fiddled with the perspective a little bit until I had a, a an angle on the scene that I thought would be good. I, I thought this is gonna be a fight scene. I gotta draw a bunch of characters. I don't want them all blocking each other. So I wanna be looking down a little bit from above. So picked an, a camera angle that's slightly looking down on the scene. And uh, uh, then I do a preliminary sketch, send it to the client, get them to sign off on it. And uh, you know, if, they, if, I, if I'm on a wrong direction, that's when they can correct me. Do a second preliminary sketch if necessary. And then uh, once that's all approved, boom, I sit down and I do the final. Uh, mostly I work uh, sitting on my sofa with my drawing pad on my knees uh, with something on the TV. And uh, it, 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 the only thing it can't be is a foreign language show where I'd have to read subtitles because as long as the characters are talking and I can glance over occasionally, it doesn't interfere with my, with my, uh, with my art. Um, and, uh, and then it's, it's just, Filling it in after after having the concept concept, it's like uh, okay, dress up these like um, kind of simplistic figures that I've put in my preliminary sketch with. Oh, it would be interesting if this guy had you know this this kind of armband, or maybe he should be the, uh, uh, this ethnic group or uh, have this style to his combat or you know it, it just, these things just kind of come to me as I go and uh, and I go with my first impulse unless it definitely sends me in a wrong direction like oh no I shouldn't give this guy a big pharaoh uh, you know Egyptian king helmet because that's blocking an important detail of what's going on behind him or maybe I could just move his head Right, I just I fiddle with the details until it's done. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, is that uh, do you always have a, a place where it's you know like hey I know I'm finished now or is it sort of like the way artists say there's a piece is never really done you just get to a point where you're like I have to walk away from it now and you know do something um, else. No, it's pretty clear to me when I'm done. I've set out to achieve a particular thing and I keep hammering at it until I've, it's got everything that I planned. Do you uh, do you ever get tired of revisiting the old uh, the old days the old TSR <laughs> stuff? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Please, please, people, hire me to do new things. I, I love doing new things. Uh, but, uh, but you know, uh, I also got to pay the bills, so I'll, uh, I, I, I don't turn people away. Uh, and the, the, there is actually one condition under which I turn people away, which is that they, if they ask me to recreate an old piece that I've already recreated, because um, that's... That's, that just seems uncool. Well, you know, you have to grow as an artist, so pushing your boundaries is an important thing. So sending you stuff to do that's new is always good. Yeah. Even if you don't get it the first try, you keep trucking at it. It's awesome. Sure. I love the way that your process works. Thank you. Thank you. It, it seems to work for me, um, you know. But like, like anybody, I sometimes I'm just can't quite 
uh, summon up the enthusiasm and uh, and may may burn a couple of days here and there, um, not getting anything done. But when I hit my stride, it's it, I, I sit and draw for hours. I wish uh, I could do that. I'm I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of myself in, in you there, Jeff. Because yeah. it's 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 very similar. I I watch movies while I while I draw. I, I do it for hours at a time. And yeah, your 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 discuss your discussion of of how much description to give sounds a lot like a sounds a lot like what I go through as well. Yeah. So I guess yeah, I, I think, think, it's, I it's, think it's, it's, it's it's very similar. In addition to you know foreign language films, I also prob uh, it's a mistake to put on something that's like especially new and exciting to me, right? Like I can't be watching the new Watchmen series. And expect to get anything done. Now I can watch it once and then play it again in the background and work. But, so, uh, something better is like a, a romance or a drama or a comedy is fine. Uh, sure. Yeah. But but if you if you if you have uh, if you have a show that's uh, that needs to be watched intensely now. So yeah, you're... it it, it, it kind of depends on how much I care about. Like if I think it's going to be full of little Easter eggs, that's a problem, right? Mandalorian can't can't watch <laughs> the, the new episode and work at the same time. Yeah, yeah. it seems like every fifteen seconds, there's like, a, oh, hey kids, remember this? Here's Salacious right. Crumb, but he's being barbecued. How about that, kids? Yeah, 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 yeah. So. That's what toilets look like in, in Star Wars. We never knew that before. <laughs> we haven't seen that before. You're right. So, so you're enjoying Watchmen? I've been debating picking that up. Sounds like you like it. Yeah, I love it. Okay, cool. Um, Alice and I have been liking it as well. But uh, for us, whenever they try and tie it to Watchmen, it, we just don't enjoy that part as much so far. But the, the universe that they're presenting beyond that, we've loved. Yeah, to, to me, it's working on the level of... Um, yeah, it seems like the same world, and it has been 40 years since the, or was it 35 or 40, whatever it is, since uh, since the events of the graphic novel. So um, it, it, I don't expect it to be just, you know, here's here's a, a night owl, and here's uh, and here's the, you know, all these all these characters from the original team, and they're just old now. And still kicking. I wouldn't have wanted it to be that. Um, and uh, well, the the stuff they've come up with that is unique and different does strike me as plausible as a development after decades from what we saw before. So, and not everybody's going to feel that way, you know. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Well, all I, all I can really tell you from what I've heard of the series is Tulsa doesn't look like that. There, there, <laughs> you see, you see scenery in the background. No, yeah. Oklahoma is flat. There's sure. nothing in the background. If you see mountains or forests, we don't have those. Yeah. I think everything filmed these days looks like it's um, actually in Vancouver or Northern exactly. California. Uh, but getting back to some to some of what we were talking about before, what are your, some of your favorite current art projects, there, Jeff? That you mean that I'm working on? Yeah. Well, um, that, that at least yeah. you can talk to. So stuff you've done recently that you really enjoy. Um, I, it's really hard to say because I've, I've mostly been getting two kinds of assignments, right? Things for upcoming RPGs that I can't talk about. That's right? fair. Or, or modules that I can't talk about and can't show on my Patreon, which is unfortunate um and then things that are very personal to the the, the client right like here you know holidays coming up and i want to get a big portrait of our whole team of characters to show to my players right so um that uh, i can be happy about what i've done but it's um uh, not not recently anything that I can point to and say, yeah, that's my great new thing, just because of circumstances. Okay. Um, I was I was very happy with the cover of Mighty Protectors and uh, and and some of the the strips in there. I especially liked the uh, 
the, the the little strip, which Jack Herman like wrote the script for all these things, right? And we just put a crap ton of them in this time. Uh, the one with uh, Maxima, who's uh, in bargaining away her power in order to rescue the rest of the Mighty Protectors. I thought that came out really well. Yeah, there's there's some excellent pieces in there. Thank you. Yeah, cool. that's, that's that's a strip from uh, revised from eighty two. Oh, going back and uh, got your Patreon over here. If people are interested, um, you've got wow, you've got it, this is really accessible. Just even one dollar for buy in. That's uh, it's very easy to get in on. Yeah, cool. and uh, the the the, uh, the the patron levels are you know. Um, like that, the first one you get to see a picture, and the the three three down the level is you're going to get a, a PDF you can print if you want to put it up on your wall. And at the five dollar level, there's uh uh what is that one? That's um oh uh it, it, on on pieces where I've done Photoshop work or um you know uh, other like technical things, you get to see the the behind the scenes. Uh, images of that, and at ten dollars, it's like here's all the preliminary sketches. You know, there's like in the in the current piece I'm working on, uh, I need to show the guards that work for the slavers, and I couldn't actually, I didn't actually find a picture of them in the module. So I looked at their stats, and oh, they have armor class four, which is this. So okay, they're going to be wearing this kind of stuff, and. It didn't actually say what their weapon was, but I looked up what does what did two D four of damage in AD and D. So um, oh, that's, a, that's a convention sketch I just did recently. That might be the coolest mind flay I've ever seen. <laughs> well, that's inspired by the one from Barrier Peaks that shows up on that title page image, right? Because he's, oh. he's in his space gear with his little handheld gadget. That's really cool. Thanks. Cool. All right. Nice. Nice. Um, so I see you have a monthly Patreon hangout. Is that a good time? Do you enjoy doing that? Um, actually, I haven't held one for a while. I've only got one or maybe two uh, backers at that level, and they don't show up. So uh, I'd be hap happy to resume <laughs> as soon as they express some interest. So. Well, here you go, fans of the Banff podcast. Um, you want to talk to Jeff every month? Uh, get on his Patreon, and uh, it's like twenty-five bucks. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the super special access level. Yeah. Oh, hey, I wanted to say hi to uh, Ellen Campbell and J.R. Handley, who are uh, commenting to us on YouTube right now. Hey, guys, how you doing? It's it's always weird having live viewers. I'm not used to that <laughs> yet. So. So I have a question for uh, for Jeff real quick. Um, sure. Because you've been so prolific throughout your time um, in the RPG industry, uh, both for art and for design, um, as you're coming up and as you're seeing a lot of these changes in technology and the way we access each other, and especially with Patreon, how we access our creators, um, has that helped your process at all? Has it hindered your process? Uh, How has that changed the way you've approached working in the industry uh, when you have to deal with social media? Well, specifically on Patreon, right? Because I did do these different backer levels where you get to see different amounts of behind the scenes stuff. I'm now documenting my work a lot more than I used to, right? It never used to be important to me to like keep uh, a, uh, a preliminary sketch or scan it and have any kind of a record of that. Um, so I've got I've got boxes full of old sketches for things that I did years and years ago. But now, um, when I finish the thing, it's like okay, so I got to put together this thing for these guys and this other thing for those guys, and, uh, lay it all out on a nice a nice eight and a half by eleven PDF for people with that backer level. So it's it's more it's more busy work um, that uh, that I never used to care about. Uh, <laughs> And that's that's really the only effect that it's had on my artwork. Now, in the in the old days when uh, when you had to work for like TSR and stuff like that, obviously, you know, scanning and, and I did you fax in artwork or anything there like that? Um, that that's interesting. Uh, at at TSR, 
Uh, no, uh, it was pretty much, you know, do the final thing and hand it, hand it to the production people and they would, uh, they would slot it in. Um, I think very occasionally, I have a vague memory, there may have been like some big photographic tool that was used to take some of the pictures that we occasionally interacted with. Um, but but uh, I, after uh, working in the uh, paper games industry for a while, I did get my break into computer games. And I was the artist on a game called Master of Orion that was a uh, science fiction uh, exploration and conquest game. And the artwork that I did for that, um, like the character drawings, were done with pen and ink on paper and yes i faxed it in because there weren't really scanners yet or there were but they were very hard to find and very expensive so i i used a fax machine because there was a way to fax to a computer that was on the phone line and that's how i got my my black and white lines in and then did the color in uh, deluxe paint or whatever was the tool back then master of orion wasn't that like a early 90s turn-based strategy game yeah. RPG? Okay, uh, no, I played no, it. It's it. it 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 a science it, fiction game. It wasn't an RPG, right? It was. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I played. You're, bits you're of a it. civilization, and uh, you know you've got your 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 resource production, and then you spend your resource points to build your ships and and research new oh, kinds yeah. of engines and things. Free right? Starcraft. Yeah. I, I did play a bit of it. I do remember yeah. like little images of it in my head, like <laughs> the. All, the I was ships. a big fan of it, Alice. Okay, yeah, because two, the cover was like two ships over a, a planet and like some sort of uh, like buildings in the background, I remember. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the cover I remember. Uh, yeah, the one on the left, left is, is the, the one first one that I, that I worked on. But I also, um, it, the, those are like the three editions that came out over the years. And then just a couple of years ago, another company acquired the rights and they went and tracked down a bunch of us guys that had worked on earlier editions. And I was a creative consultant on that one. Microprose made some awesome video games back in the day. Uh, yeah. I, I, I wasted a lot of my life enjoying those. <laughs> Now, when you get those phone calls from people who have tracked you down to reinvigorate an older project, do you do you get that that sense like, are you kidding me, really, or, or are you like, hey, cool, hey, I'd love to do more of this? Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I think it's mostly positive. <laughs> you know, I uh, I'm I'm happy that people still care, and uh, and you know whatever I can do to to help out, I'm happy to help. Now, do you ever get a cameo in some of these games, like where you end up as a red shirt and they kill you, murder, like in epic murderous fashion? Or you know, no, it's, come... it's it's different than that. Like um, in the uh, the spaceships in the original Master of Orion were literally uh, sprite graphics that I drew pixel by pixel in oh. eight, right? Uh, maybe thirty two pixels by 32 pixels right and i had to do the, the tiny little fighter craft all the way up in stages through the great big battleship thing in i think there were eight different styles of ships so some of them were spheres with engines attached and some of them were triangular and some of them were you know all the all these different basic designs so when this latest game came out in one of their promotional videos, they took one of my pixel-based ships and then uh, did an animation where it became cubes and then the cubes became 3D and then you zoomed back and it became more realistic until it was like a fully fleshed out modern, you know, 3D graphics quality ship flying around. So my cameo is some of my work appeared as part of that video hearkening back to the old days you know and i can point to things like you know the what are they called the darlocks who are like the evil cloaked figures they told me uh in the new version of the game that oh the tool we're using for our 3d graphics on the characters doesn't do um 
doesn't do uh, uh, what do you call it uh, a cloth animation as well. And so we're not going to be able to put the Darlocks in cloaks. And I said, okay, fine. Well, here's some sketches of other ways you can put them in suits of various kinds that would hide what they really look like under there. And and they went with one of those ideas. So you know, I can point it at things where my suggestions mattered. But me personally showing up, no, they didn't. No, I'm not sure I would want that. <laughs> you you don't want to get the red shirt treatment, a la Star Trek. Yeah. I don't know. So this image I found on your Patreon, this is a sequel image to the cover yes. of Isle of Dread. Yeah, I've done a number of those too. That is pretty cool. It's just a few moments later. I think that's the first module that I ever got. And uh -huh. it's because I had a friend who, he didn't play D&D, &D, but for some reason had gotten that. And so I did. And so he gave it to me. And it was really early on when I was getting D&D, &D, but... Right on. Now, where? Uh, what are some of the things you're working on right now? Um, so, apart from uh, continuing to do contract work to uh, to pay my bills, um, Jack Herman and I still owe some books to our Mighty Protectors backers. And yes, I've become one of those people that's slow to deliver, and I feel terrible about it. Um, so uh, I think that last, happens. last time I was on, I, uh, I, I, I said what was out then. Since the last time I was on your show, we did get out the, for the first full, complete adventure for Mighty Protectors called Market Forces, uh, which is uh, you're fighting international like drug runners and stuff that have powers. And, um, uh, and the great thing about that adventure is it comes with um, stats for a lot of like mundane weapons and vehicles and things. So it's sort of like a little mini equipment catalog. Now, and just to like, be well, clear, was that yeah. you are fighting international drug runners or you're fighting international drug runners? Like, are you these people or do you get to beat them up? Because both ways uh, you could sell the you game. Beat them up. You beat them up. <laughs> Thank you for, <laughs> for questioning that. Uh, uh, and then uh, we've got a we've got a, a book called it's a PDF called uh, um, uh, it's a gang guide first in a series with the um, the roller girls sort of a roller skating bunch of thugs that you can use to back up a super villain so that we have some, gotten some new things out since then but it's been a while and i'm uh really, really far behind the next thing that's gonna come out is our world war ii source book called war heroes and um it's just gigantic and i'm plugging away at it and i'll get it out there as soon as we possibly can well i mean world war ii is kind of a lot to cover well, it's, it's, it's also material taken from the playtest campaign for Mighty Protectors, which ran for six years. So there's a lot of material that was generated for that, and it's pretty much all in there. Yeah, I was trying to pull up Roller Girls right here, and I can get the catalog page on drive through rpg but um, I'm getting no art on anything on that page. What? So, I don't think it's – I think it would be – Oh, no, none of, yeah, nothing's loading. That, that, that might be just a problem with drive through RPG right now, because occasionally they do have issues. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The internet is not a perfect place that works all the time. <laughs> well, you're also using Firefox, and more and more uh, companies, the programming just no longer supports Firefox. Like, Facebook literally will pop a warning now if you use Firefox and tell you uh, that, that they will be phased out. No, that you will be phased out soon, <laughs> that there will be zero support soon. So, you know, you're using Firefox. So some of it might be Firefox, I'm just saying. I get the same result on Chrome. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Oh, well, maybe drive throughs having a, a lunchtime problem. And once the guy gets back from uh, Cadoba, everything will be fixed. <laughs> 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 Ugly truth of IT support, let me tell you. Oh, oh my uh, God, I want burritos. Uh, <laughs> burritos are good. The world's a better place because burritos are here. Uh, right. And the world's a better place for Jeff D being here. Jeff, I know you're a busy man. I appreciate you making time to come talk to us. Um, oh, it's been my pleasure. 
yeah. Getting ready to wrap up so I can return to the bidding of my uh, soulless corporate overlords who pay my bills. Um, any closing thoughts before we wrap it up? You're, you're supposed um, to like bow for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm one of those slaves who looks at you side eye before I go, you know, harvest the whatever I'm supposed to harvest. I, uh, but sorry, Jeff, you were saying? <laughs> Jeff, sorry about that. Uh, no, it's fine. Um, uh, closing thoughts. Uh, well, thanks for having me back on. Um, uh, I, uh, I'd love to be back to talk about some of the things. Um, uh, you guys have invited me several times over the years, and I'm always like tremendously busy. So, uh, But I'll, I'll try to make more time for you if you want to have me on for one of your other shows, you know talking about uh, stuff that is actually exactly what i was about to hit you up for is the babies with knives would uh love to host you let you stab a few of our characters in a in a one shot of mighty protectors we love uh, that awesome i don't know about about it. can can you in fact instead be the babies with the knives stabbing bad guys with your knives that, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, we, and we, we love, love that allow us. i'd be more comfortable with that in the superhero <laughs> But what if they're evil babies? What if they're all Hitler babies? Well, that's up to you. Are they evil babies? Then I guess they'll have to be blasted. Oh, I wish you guys had a better title, but it does all get talked about. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a conversation starter. Uh, well, oh, sure. Are we are we friends on Facebook? Uh, well, mm -hmm. I'll Not go yet. find you and send you. Yep. Yes. Not yet, but we will be soon. Send me friend requests, and we'll just pick it up there. Absolutely. All right, cool. Uh, Walt, Jacob, any, uh, any closing uh, tidbits before we wrap things up? Please support the Banff Patreon to keep this wonderful show running. <laughs> you get that PBS <laughs> voice, Jacob. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. I, <laughs> I try. Just wanted to say thank you to Jeff for uh, producing amazing artwork throughout the years and also for uh, uh, keeping great games alive and, and you know keeping uh, a fresh thought on how games should be approached. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. yeah, I'm a big. I've still got a picture of. I I want to say it's Odin uh, from your deities and Demigods Kickstarter a few years back um, over on my bookshelf. So yeah, big fan from boy, 20, 30 years ago. How do you look so young, Jeff? Uh, clean living. Clean living. <laughs> <laughs> everyone always says clean living. No one's like it's the heroin. <laughs> <laughs> it's because people for... who people who are addicted to heroin look like well Keith Richards. But and thank you for right. providing people like me, you know, a gateway 20 plus years ago. My pleasure. <laughs> Going to stop there at the age, but over to lots and lots and lots of years ago. Thank you. All right. No worries. Um, I'm going to wrap things up. Hey, viewers and listeners and Ellen and J.R. Hanley, who I think are our only two viewers right now. Um, appreciate you checking us out. And we'll catch you next time on the Banff Podcast. Bye, everyone.